Hi, I'm Melinda Van Fleet, and welcome to the Confident Conversations podcast. I'm a confidence and peak performance coach, best-selling author, and speaker who helps business women develop confidence to believe in themselves, take action, and get results. This podcast shares authentic and transparent, thought-provoking stories, tips, and tools from my experiences, as well as incredible guests, so you can continue to build your confidence and live your best life. Thank you for joining me. Let's get started on this confidence journey. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Confident Conversations podcast. I am so grateful that you are joining us today because I have a very special guest that I am excited to share with you. Her name is Charmaine Hammond, and she is a highly sought after business keynote and workshop speaker entrepreneur, author, and educator who teaches and advocates the importance of developing trust, healthy relationships, and collaboration in the workplace. She has helped clients in many industries build collaborative, resilient, and engaged workplaces, develop high trust, high accountability relationships, and solve workplace issues and conflict that gets in the way of success and profitability. She is respected as a no-fluff I love that. (laughs) And rich content speaker who delivers tangible tools to step into action immediately. And just so everyone knows, I love to share how I know people. And Charmaine and I were connected through the amazing Patty Farmer, who is the guru behind Marketing, Media, and Money magazine. And I'm a columnist in the magazine this year, if you've been following me. And Charmaine has been a guest writer, how many times? Uh, a couple now, I think. So yeah. yeah, it's a great magazine. Yeah. So Patty connected us and I'm super excited to have you on the podcast. So welcome. Thank you. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes. And we have to kick off because I am so dang curious. <laughs> <laughs> you were a former correctional officer. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> That's like not a normal, like career path. How did that happen? No, I'm I'm sure my mom and dad still ask themselves that question. How did that happen? Because in school, I was painfully shy and didn't like to be in crowds, didn't like to be centered out, just like to uh, sort of uh, be quiet in the background. And then in grade nine, I had this incredible English teacher, Ms. Erstikaitis, and she helped draw me out of my shell and and uh, help me find my voice. And that's when I started looking at career paths in grade nine. I knew I wanted a career where I could help people and make a difference. And perhaps being young, I decided that career would be helping people in the jail system. And so became a correctional officer, but really found my passion working with young offenders. And when I left that career, I had worked myself up to a leadership role of a young offender medium custody facility. Wow. Oh my gosh. Do you, um, so how did you end up merging out of that then? Like (laughs) that's yeah. Cause that, cause that is such an impactful job, especially if you were working with youth. So, um, yeah, a little more. It was, so I was in that career for uh, just over 10 years and then followed the man I loved across the prairies in Canada uh, to a community that the jail was closed. I had, there was a lot of people that could have filled it, I'm sure, but uh, the jail was not open for business. So I needed to find a different career and fell upon working as the executive director of a women's crisis facility, which I loved and um, worked in the nonprofit sector for uh, several years and then transferred over to uh, mental health in the government. And then eventually in the background of all of that, I was going back to school and, and worked on my degree and then a master's degree in conflict analysis and management and then opened up a mediation practice. And that was in 1997. So have had my own businesses since then. Wow. And can you explain what a mediator is, just in case someone out there doesn't know? Absolutely. A mediator is really a facilitator of conflict related conversations, a facilitator that helps the parties that are in disagreement come to a resolution that they can live with. And um, so I I started out actually mediating in family cases, parent teen conflict. 
and separation and divorces. And then I started to specialize in workplace conflict. So I facilitated thousands and thousands of people through hundreds and hundreds of conversations. And what I loved about being a mediator is that my role was to facilitate process and help the parties come up with their own solutions. So it's not like a judge where you hear both sides and and then make a determination of the outcome. You actually help guide the parties into coming up with their own solutions and uh, solutions that, that they can live with. And I found that role to just be incredibly fascinating to see people that could almost not be in the same room together. You know, they wouldn't look at each other. There was such animosity um, and an emotion going on in many of these relationships, but through a process that was guided and where they were supported and there was an opportunity to be heard by the other party, watching these conversations happen and people coming up with their own solutions was just incredibly inspiring. And some of my best lessons actually uh, in life came from the clients that I worked with. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So on a personal note, because I'm sitting here thinking that it's, um, it makes me think of what I, you know, go through with my husband. right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) So how would someone let's say they were just struggling, like what, what's a top side tip or point of view that even like you can just apply at home? Like if someone's like, okay, I'm just, we're just not seeing eye to eye on, I'm going to make this up. Who's going to take care of the kids? <laughs> so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't have kids, yes. so this isn't a real life example, but I'm just kind of like sharing that something could, you know, someone out there could benefit from just kind of like getting grounded to how you could start Mm -hmm. the process? Well, yeah, great question. One, One takeaway tip around how to get grounded with the process would be to be really cognizant of the assumptions that we hold in our mind. We make assumptions all day long about other people, about our, um, about our situations, about other people's emotions, uh, you know, their interactions. And if we can cut out the assumptions, that's a big part of the challenge. And and in fact, when I was a mediator, that was a big part of my role, clarifying assumptions and getting to actual concrete uh, information. And I remember years and years ago when I was a mediator and I was working on a a family dispute and it was really going sideways. (laughs) And part of what was causing it to go sideways was just the assumptions that both of them held about each other. And when I was able to ask a lot of open-ended questions, those are questions that start with who, what, where, when, why, and how. What started to happen is slowly, it was like the, the thread was being unraveled. And instead of making up assumptions about what the other person said or what the other person meant, we were actually able to clarify that. And when the assumptions were out of the way, the stress level on both parties. It was like two different people sitting in my office. But the other thing that happened is that it opened the door for solutions. And I remember in that mediation saying, remember, proving someone wrong does not make you right. Mm -hmm. And this is really important because in conflict, people spend a lot of time and energy trying to prove the other person's perspective wrong. The thing with perspectives is they're just that, perspective. My perspective is how I see the situation. Your perspective is how you see it. Those perspectives come uh, to fruition for, you know, we've each had our own experience. We have our own beliefs, our own values. And if we can reduce the assumptions and then stop trying to prove people wrong so that we think we can be right, that will actually allow the conversation to move forward in a much healthier and respectful way. Mm. I love that. And that is so right on. Thank you for sharing that, (laughs) saying that. So what I'm noticing in like my age group, let's say, is they're at a point where they're struggling with getting their better half to communicate, Mm. start that conversation. They're just really struggling there. It's just this... um, yeah, it's just this major block. 
Mm-hmm. So without going, you know, to outside help, let's say that's not the space they're in, they're, they're not either ready for that or not open to that in general. How can they start to get those conversations going? What would you advise? Yeah, part of it, and this is a learning for every relationship, whether they be personal relationships with our partners or our children, or whether they be professional relationships in our workplace and volunteer jobs, is that people communicate differently. And we generally approach the other person the way that we communicate. There's a fantastic inventory. I just love this tool. It's by a gentleman named Hal Stacks, S-T-A-C-K-S. And he has what's called the working style inventory. And Hal Stacks says there's, there's four different working styles. These are not personalities. They're working styles. There's that driver who's the kind of get it done, let's just get this solved. There's the amiable that is all about relationships, peace, trust, and harmony. There is the um, analytical that's very process-driven and really needs a lot of questions answered before they can make a decision. And then there's the expressive, which is that big picture thinker. And often they don't even know that they're in conflict. And when you understand that people communicate differently, you can actually approach situations differently. So a great example is my husband, Christopher, and I. Uh, he, is, <laughs> he is a true and true driver and analytical. Very different communication style for me as a driver and an expressive. And I have learned that when I show up in conversation more like him instead of more like me, the conversation is much smoother and we actually get to results quicker. So part of that is knowing how your partner, your family member, your colleagues, how they communicate. If they are, uh, if they are a person that needs a lot of information before they can respond or if they need to have um, time before they can actually give you an answer. I know my husband, Chris, will say, I don't know. Uh, He'll say, I don't know. I'll ask him, how how do you feel about that? And I learned that that F word, feel, is not one that he um, uses very often in his vocabulary. So when I simply change the word from feel to think, what do you think about that, Chris? It changed the conversation. Now, it takes a lot of effort. Um, And the other one is removing the word but and replacing it with and. As soon as we say but in a conversation, it's like everything that came before the but is minimized or uh, disagreed with. So use the word and instead of but if you want to pull people into the dialogue with you instead of it being a monologue. Yes. And that tip in itself is so gold. I feel like having a quarter jar for even when I catch myself, <laughs> you know, when you put the quarter in for every time you swear. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. If you, if you treated the word, but like that, and, and you became aware of how many times you say it, <laughs> it's actually eye opening, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I, I know that as a, as a facilitator, I go into a lot of companies and lead training sessions and uh, team building sessions. And I hear the word, but a lot, and it's often presented like, you know, that's a great idea, but what I'm thinking instead, (laughs) so it's like, that's a great idea. And we're going to simply put your idea over there because mine is way more important or mine is better. And that, even though that may not be the intent, Mm -hmm. that is what the person hears. And this is the whole part of communication that is so darn tricky and why I love being a mediator. Because as a mediator, you're just an observer. You're an outside person to their conflict. So even though you might be affected by what the people are saying, it isn't your conflict. It isn't your relationship. So you can actually see things differently. And I remember there's been so many times when I was in mediation training years and years ago, I would learn a new skill. And who do we practice? us on our loved ones. <laughs> I remember Chris saying one day, were you just in a course? And I said, well, I was. Why? And he said, because you're, you're, you're role playing on me. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I discovered from that was that the skills I was learning were different than the skills I might have been using in our relationship to that point. 
as you try out new skills, just be patient with yourself and with the people that you're in conversation with, because they'll kind of be looking at you like, hmm, what's going on? That's what, that's not what she might normally say. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of um, practice to communicate effectively. And here's the best tip I can give you back to your question, Melinda, about marriages and partnerships and those close relationships we have with people in our families or at work practice and prepare we have the most important conversations with people that mean so much to us and we go in and we wing it without any preparation without managing our emotions and relations get relationships get damaged and destroyed so the best practice tip I can give you and I use this myself is to actually write your thoughts down on a piece of paper with a sharpie marker about what you want to say to the other person. You don't write their response because they never say what you're going to want them to say. Anyways, then you go into a a room with a mirror, like the bathroom, for example, and you practice those words that you want to say to the other person at least 10 times out loud. And you look at how you look in the mirror. Do you look nervous? Do you look calm? Do you look confident? Do you look accusational? Do you look angry? Do you look curious? And as you practice, you will actually work out some of the drama that you might not even know you have attached to this issue. And when you get into that real conversation 10 minutes from them or the next day from that, you'll be more confident. And if you forget what you were going to say, you've practiced 10 times or more and your brain will find the words for you. Oh my God. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> I have never thought or heard about looking in the mirror and practicing. That's it's amazing. So and then we, they- we actually had to do that as a mediator, Melinda. As part of our training, we had these little mirrors and we had to sit. It was so uncomfortable. Um, and so we had to, the, the instructor would give us a question um, that we would have to ask you know, in future to the parties and we'd ask it in front of the mirror and then we'd ask it a different way. And then we'd use different body language with it. And the whole purpose was getting us to be cognizant about how we looked when we communicate, because what if as a mediator, I looked nervous, that doesn't create confidence in the room. Or what if I looked angry at something that somebody said in the process? So this was the most powerful learning for me ever around communication and it's one that I use I I have said in parking lots (laughs) as I'm preparing to go into a meeting that I'm a little apprehensive about and I have had the conversation with myself in the rear view mirror (laughs) before I go in wow yeah my, my brain is like on fire so let me say one thing first this is communication is one of the most valuable I don't someone might even say the most valuable you know, tools and skills that we have to learn in this lifetime, right? Because mm-hmm. everything's around communication. So it's amazing when you think about the fact that we might practice, you know, um, the piano or training for a marathon, you know, all mm-hmm. these things, but we don't practice communication at yes. all. Like I yes. have made a valiant effort in the past few years to make sure I take a break, right? Like walk away or, Mm -hmm. you know, or even respect my husband's space if he needs time to process because, Mm -hmm. you know, similar to what you were saying before with uh, your husband, but I've never practiced in the mirror. And it makes sense to me because I do daily Facebook lives and my whole journey Mm -hmm. of speaking into the camera, you know, has been um, an amazing journey. And it, it goes hand in hand, like you're, you're practicing, you're, you're getting better yes. and you're watching yourself and you're going, okay, that facial expression, or I didn't smile enough, or was my energy right? It all goes hand in hand. Why wouldn't I do that with my life, with my most valuable thing I have, which is my relationship with my husband or my family. So, yes. um, yeah, that's brilliant. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that tip. That's really amazing. You know, we, we kind of, I love what you've just said, Melinda, and it, it's sort of like how we show up in conversations teaches other people how to communicate with us. So if we show up impatient or um, frustrated or distrustful, 
that's actually what we're teaching the other person to do back to us. And so there's so much preparation in communication. And, you know, when we can reduce the drama, when we can put the history aside, uh, especially in, in close relationships in partners and, and with our children and, and our in-law families, there, there's history there and there's certain ways of communicating. And we kind of have to put that aside um, to be able to communicate effectively. And another tip is what you think about is what you bring into the conversation. I remember having a conversation years ago. Uh, I actually had to give client um, some feedback and it, I didn't think they were, I made an assumption that that individual was not going to respond well to the feedback. So I'd already made it as an assumption and the way that I was practicing the feedback was coming out exactly with that assumption. So I created, if I had have had the real conversation, I would have created um, not a great dialogue. And so what, what we think about conflict, if our mind is saying, oh, this is going to suck, this is going to be awful, that's actually what we create in the dialogue. And so spend that time changing your mindset. I always remind people that it's just a conversation. Mm -hmm. And if we can plant that seed, it's likely going to be a different, more effective dialogue. Wow. Yeah. So you have law of attraction communication lessons here, which is great. (laughs) (laughs) It is fascinating. I'm about to publish my second book. It'll be the end of July. And I share a story in, in, in the book about um, something that happened in relation to an event that I hosted in April of 2019. And, and I'm sitting here listening to you share that advice, thinking, you know, I was at the time thinking I did a good job of mentally prepping for the worst case scenario conversation. But mm-hmm. now I'm like, wow, I wonder if I would have been mentally prepping for it to work out positively something that happened in regards to the event, if it would have turned out different, I'd like to go back in time and try it again. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe in another life. You know, and and there's, there's the, you, you've just reminded me about the power of statements of hope. And I, and, and what I mean by that is when we frame our conversation, even if we're nervous, it's okay to be nervous. It's totally okay to be uncomfortable. Conflict is messy. It's, you know, most people are not comfortable in that dialogue. So a statement of hope could be something like, um, Chris, I know we've got some important stuff to, to chat about. I really value our relationship. Our marriage is so important to me. Let's figure out how we can talk about this together in a way that works for us. So when you start with a statement of hope versus I'm so ticked off with you, or how could you have done that to me again? (laughs) When we start off with those kind of statements, we've just taken the conversation down that path. Statements of hope um, provide both people feeling a little bit more comfortable. And I have even said things in dialogue, like um, I'm uncomfortable sharing this right now. However, my relationship with you is important enough to me that I'm going <laughs> to, you know, put my boots on and wait around in this messiness of discomfort because our relationship is worth it. So when you can let people know how you're feeling, even if you're uncomfortable, mm-hmm. it yeah. can really take the conversation forward. Yeah. And that just opened up a whole level of vulnerability, which, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it just softens the tone. It softens the experience. One of the things I read about, in uh, read in one of your blogs was the bookend. So it's, mm. would you say like the, the bookend on the left your first, is more of like a statement of hope framework? Like how would you explain bookends? Yeah, the, I, the, the first 90 seconds and the last 90 seconds of a dialogue are so important because the first 90 seconds, that one bookend uh, sets the tone. And that last bookend, that last 90 seconds is what people walk away feeling, thinking, or doing. Mm -hmm. And so starting with, as you said, Melinda, that kind of statement or hope of hope or framing the conversation, even something like, thank you for putting time aside today to talk about this. I know this is an important issue for both of us and we can get through this. Mm -hmm. So that's a bookend on the, on the one side. And then at the end, 
instead, what I've heard some people say is things like, whew, thank goodness that's over. (laughs) (laughs) And so while we're thinking thinking that, exactly, uh, because the other person might say, well, in their head, well, what does that mean? And so instead, you know, that's the, the inside brain. So a bookend on the other side might be, I really appreciate your honesty with me today. I know that was a tough conversation and we got through it. Thank mm-hmm. you. And and now let's go do a shot of tequila. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, communication. Oh my gosh. I could probably talk to you for hours. This is amazing. I love these tips. I love, love, love these tips. These are oh, great. really we didn't even get to all the things that we kind of emailed back and forth. about. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anything else you'd like to add or share before we wrap up? Cause this has been a truly amazing conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I would just say, um, be gentle on yourself. We, you know, we kick ourselves in the pants a lot when we say something that didn't come out the way we wanted. So be gentle on yourself and you can always do the mulligan. That's the do over. If you say something that didn't land well, or you're kicking yourself in the pants later saying, I wish I didn't say that. Let the other person in on it. Oh. Just go up to them and say, you know what, what I said yesterday In my head, it sounded great. When it came out of my lips, it didn't sound great. I want to do that again. Mm -hmm. This is what I meant to say instead. And just fix it. Mm -hmm. I I actually had to do that with a friend. And she said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I said, well, you know that conversation three weeks ago? She said, yeah, it was the the best conversation ever. (laughs) So here I had stressed out for three weeks thinking that my comment had been offensive. And she didn't even... There was she did not feel that at all. And so she thanked me for saying it. And then of course she said, Shar, I can't believe you waited three weeks to tell me that. But, but it took me three weeks to kind of pro it, like process it. So be gentle on yourself and we all mess up. I mean, I, I teach and breathe these skills and I still need to come back and practice them just like with that example. Mm-hmm. Oh, you just packed so much into that. That's um, amazing. Recognizing we all have mind loops. Number one. Yes. I talk about mind loops a lot because um, my husband really deals with a lot of mind loops. I'm sure he's going to appreciate me saying this, but I've kind of said it before. <laughs> <laughs> and I've worked on it, but still I have them too, like for sure. And yeah, and then sometimes it just takes time to process it and that's okay. Mm-hmm. So the fact that you you took three weeks, I mean, that is happens to people. So at least you processed it and circled back to end that mind loop. And I can't even count how many times when I've circled back with someone, they're like, yeah, what are you talking about? (laughs) So so yeah, so then it helps to just be like, okay, great, done, off the list, off my brain. (laughs) uh, Yeah, getting getting that closure, but that takes Mm. confidence. That, That takes confidence in building that over time that you realize that it, it's a win-win to circle back and have those conversations versus me, perhaps feeling small or ashamed mm-hmm. or, or, you know, or just bad about yourself or, you know, I'm going to use a, a word here that's probably not the best, but like stupid, you know, like we mm-hmm. tend to beat ourselves up in that direction. And instead of just like, let's get the elephant out of the room here and I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. You know, just close, close the door, whether you need to have a further conversation or the person was like, yeah, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> so mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I know that's, yeah, a- it's, it's sort of like, don't wait, communicate. Cause, cause uh, there's a great quote by judge Esty who I don't know who judge Esty is, but I love the quote. And the quote is wine. Um, conflict is not like wine. It doesn't get better with age. <gasps> oh, <laughs> isn't yes. that brilliant? I yes. wish I wrote that. It's brilliant. <laughs> that is very good. Yeah, you're, there's no winning that. Um, yeah. so I like when you said in the beginning, proving someone wrong doesn't make you right. It it kind of mm-hmm. all goes in that in that bucket. So yeah, yes, yeah. Well, great way to close the circle. <laughs> 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 that's awesome how can everyone get hold of you uh probably best way would be on our website at charmainehammond.com or raiseadream.com oh 
wow. And raise a dream. You got it. You can't leave me hanging like that. Like (laughs) raise a dream is one of my companies where we help people raise their dreams through collaborations and partnerships. Oh, wow. Well, that's beautiful. I love that. That's absolutely gorgeous. Wow. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for joining me. And I hope the audience just really appreciated all these tips. These are actually life changing everyone if you take the action and do it. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.